I hope you guys have installed it. And if not, actually right now is a really good time to do that. It's really easy to, to try it out, to use it. Um, there shouldn't be any problems there. And I'd love to go through it step by step and look at what it looks like and all the different features, but we don't have time for that today. Cockpit is, uh, as you know, a Linux admin interface. It lets you remotely access Linux, load it in a browser, interactively configure it, discover it, and it makes Linux usable. And over the last, let's say, year or so, this has gone a lot further than where we were here at DevConf last year. The, sorry, make sure this works. It's not. Here we go. That's kind of what it looks like. There's a bunch of different topics and different things that you can get into on the side. You log in. You feel like you're on the server, and you are on the server. Um, and, and you can, of course, do things like networking, storage, and all uh, configuration, looking at the journal logs, and so on. Let's take a quick peek before we go into um, deeper details on what the goals of Cockpit are. And these transcend the Cockpit project itself. The first goal is making Linux discoverable for a broader audience. People who before would have given up on Linux, given up because the first thing that they are required to do is deal with the, the root bash pump, which is pure power, by the way, and really awesome. But it does prevent people from getting started. So Cockpit takes away that barrier and lets people, uh, Windows admins, for example, or people who, pre who would have uh, gotten scared away, start with Linux. The second thing is to take complex Linux features that we can all deal with, but we may not want to. We may not want to spend time on them and uh, make them usable, make them discoverable, such as setting up a network bond or other things like that, where you'd, you'd, you'd have to read a bunch of blog posts. You'd have to figure out exactly um, how you want to accomplish this and then go and do it and read the manual pages and then figure out how to make it work after boot. Those kind of things are just trivial to accomplish. And then when you, when you do them, you can move on to what you really wanted to, to, the task that you really wanted to do. So a lot of these play out in the user interface, in the admin interface, in the browser UI. But these same goals, that's something we want to talk to you about today, is these same goals, were, when, when we fix them in the, in the UI, it has ramification in, on the command line, or on another tool, or another script, or another way of interacting with that that makes it, these tools discoverable, complete, and actually usable. So there's, there's just so much we could go into, but we've picked some topics, and I hope that they're compelling, that they give you ideas, they call out, and they're kudos to the people who have gotten involved and contributed. So for any of these things, if you want more information, um, talk to us. There's Dominic and Peter up here, joined us last year. Up front here are Andreas and Marius. These are the guys who started Cockpit. And I think Lars is hiding somewhere up there. He's going to be joining us soon. There he is. So you're welcome. And tomorrow there's a Hackfest in the morning, too. Very early, unfortunately. But when you're interested in some aspect of this, we're going to be talking about containers. We're going to be talking about testing, continuous integration. We're going to be talking about how it works with atomic hosts and all of these things. So for any of those aspects, figure out how to nail us down and ask for more details or how we can go forward and make, uh, make something happen in the future. And we've tried hard to remove the excuses. Cockpit is zero footprint. We want it to be installable by default. It starts on demand, exits after use, doesn't have a big fat intermediate stack. It's pure UI. Um, and so when you're, when, look for the excuses. I hope you don't find them. When you're dealing with this stuff, don't assume. Look and see how, at each step, we've worked really hard to take away the reasons not to use this, not to integrate with this. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Peter. All right, hi, everyone. Uh, so um, OS tree and cockpit. Um, I won't get too into uh, the details. There were some really good presentations uh, on it yesterday. But 
Uh, basically, RPM OS tree um, allows you to have an immutable uh, operating system that's based on RPMs. So uh, this last year, we worked on um, getting support for that in Cockpit. So uh, this is a bit what it looks like. Uh, you can see sort of what packages are currently installed in your system, um, the version you're on. You can see what was previously there, you know, what the changes are from that and what you're running now. Um, you have the option of rolling back. You can check for updates. Um, see what's there, and um, you you get to inspect like the exact details before you install and see exactly what changed, what's added, what's updated. You know, sometimes there's downgrades or whatever, and of course you can um, go ahead and install those updates. Um, uh, the nice thing about this is that when uh, you doing this, if this gets interrupted or canceled in any way, you know you're uh, running your operating system not affected at all, you know, you boot back exactly to where you were before. So let's skip ahead because it takes a bit. Uh, your computer's got a reboot after that, and you can see that um, the new uh, updates are installed. Uh, you're on the new version. So that's uh, the, the UI. So um, getting that working wasn't uh, quite as fast and simple as it looked. Um, there was some issues with uh, RPM OS tree that we had to work through, and um, you know, to be able to, you know, deliver on the, the promise that the that UI makes. Um, we actually see this quite a bit working on, you know, different projects, cockpit. Uh, sometimes when you're coming at it from a, you know, top-down level and seeing, okay, what's the user actually trying to accomplish? What do we then need the tool to do? And it helps sort of complete the picture for something like RPM OS tree, you know, takes it from being like a cool tool to something that's really just, you know, works for the end user. Um, so one of the first problems we had was um, the fact that uh, you couldn't really predict what was going to happen when you did an upgrade. Uh, you, you could look and see, hey, what's new? It would tell you, um, and then you could install it, but if something changed on the upstream server that you're pulling from in the meantime, then you just installed something that you didn't get to see. So um, that was a problem. So uh, together with the Atomic guys, we worked on adding a new verb, uh, deploy, which allows you to, so you can look and see, okay, what's new? And then it gives you the version, it gives you the hash, and uh, you can say, okay, I like these changes, G give me this exact version. And that way it's predictable. You can run this on multiple machines or one machine or whatever, but you know exactly what you're gonna get. Uh, another issue was um, with the command, uh, you, uh, if multiple users try to run certain commands at the same time, they might conflict with each other, you might end up sort of messing up your operating system, so that wasn't good. So um, Colin added some uh, uh, OS tree level locking that you know, helps make sure that um, you know, these commands are safe and it just won't let you do something that's, you know, something else is in progress. Uh, and lastly, uh, we added a, a DBus API to the service so that um, it helps with the multi-user thing so you can see what else is going on. It also allows Cockpit to you know, provide the nice interface, all the details about the packages, the versions, all that kind of stuff without having to do weird screen scraping or other um, things that we prefer not to do. Um, so, yeah, in the end, I, I think what came out is pretty well. Um, I'm missing a slide here, but uh, there's definitely more still to come, more that we can do. Um, things like uh, allowing rebases, better support for multiple operating systems, uh, picking your upstream servers that you want to pull from and verifying them with keys and all that. And hopefully we'll see more of that uh, this coming year. Uh, so our next um, uh, containers uh, in Cockpit. So uh, in Cockpit, uh, we've added uh, this last year a Kubernetes uh, UI. Um, it's uh, focused around uh, what system administrators will want to do more than uh, developer use cases. But you know, you allow uh, to deploy here. We're deploying just a simple mock service. Um, you can see your pods. Uh, pods are like your collection of containers. You can see what the details of the container that's running. Uh, check out the logs. Uh, you can you know shell into the containers and you know type commands and um, do whatever you need to do. Uh, replication controllers are. Uh, what controls the pods, uh, make sure there's the right amount of them running and all that. Again, you have um, control and visibility into what's happening. Uh, services is how uh, you interact with pods as they come and go. Um, so, you know, there's a nice UI for um, interaction with those and seeing what's exposed. There's also this um, graph kind of helps uh, 
clarify what what's actually going on system, how your objects are related to each other, and you can make adjustments. And you know, there we just added another pod, and you know, it springs up, and you can see how things um, are related to each other. Uh, there's there's a lot more there, of course. Uh, sort of just a quick overview uh, of what's there. Um, but uh, what I wanted to talk about more is, so this you can see is kind of in the standard cockpit. You've got your machines and your dashboard and all the other uh, cockpit pieces are here and present. But what we wanted to do is get this running um, as a, a pod in Kubernetes itself. So, you know, eating our own dog food and um, making it work the way we're telling people that they should be running their uh, applications. Um, so, uh, one of the problems is um, with the downward API actually gives us a lot of um, really good stuff for making our container work. Uh, but there's a few things missing. So um, in this case, we have to tell the container uh, what the public um, URL for our, our kube master is, as well as the, the URL that we want to run our container on. Uh, I'll get into the, more about that later. But basically, so we can use the uh, OpenShift uh, template feature to you know generate our objects, and then we can just pipe it to OC create, and uh, we get our um, our Kubernetes container running. So now I've hooked this one up to GitHub as the OAuth provider. Uh, it's using uh, OpenShift, and you can see we log in with GitHub, and because uh, that's how OpenShift's configured, and now we're in. And you can see this is totally different from the other one. There's nothing else available. Uh, all that's here is we've got our uh, Kubernetes OpenShift UI, and that's because this is actually running inside a container. It's isolated from the host system. doesn't have access. It doesn't make sense to do any of that other stuff. Uh, in order to make this work, we have to sort of refactor uh, the way we do authentication in Cockpit, make it a little more uh, pluggable, and we're hoping that that's going to lead to some more interesting um, uses of Cockpit, like where different pieces of the Cockpit UI can be sort of separated out and you know, run uh, differently like this. So just to show that we are, in fact, running in a, a totally um, uh, you know, a real pod. Here we're going to kill our pod. We kill our replication controllers. So a new one doesn't come up. And then we uh, kill the pod. And Kubernetes takes a minute or two to um, kill it off. But once it does, we lose our connection. And um, you know, we can't load back. So you know, we killed ourselves from inside here. Uh, so um, this works, and you can actually uh, use it and run it if you pull from the GitHub page. It's not quite as smooth as we'd like. Um, like I mentioned, uh, one, of the, one of the things that would be nice is uh, uh, not a lot of stuff is running, I think, especially with the Kubernetes UI. Like the OpenShift uh, web console doesn't run as a pod, or the OpenShift registry does run as a pod, but it still requires like some special cased commands and... Uh, things to to really get it going. So, in trying to do this, one of the the big issues you run into is dealing with external um, URLs. These are like things like my example here. I want my Kubernetes um, master. Where is that publicly available? Or my my uh, uh, cockpit instance. Where is that going to be publicly available? And communicating about those things within Kubernetes and OpenShift um, is a little bit is not very easy to do right now. So that would be something that would be nice to get fixed. Another thing is uh, some of the authentication de defaults, uh, whether you're using Kubernetes or OpenShift, are a little um, not super user friendly. Like OpenShift by default will allow accept any username or password. That's the default OAuth configuration. Uh, you probably really never want to actually deploy that. Um, Steph has a, a great PR for. Um, making system users uh, be a, a supported uh, OAuth backend, something like that might make a good uh, default. And with uh, Kubernetes, um, you, you know, pretty much make this work. You've got to enable basic auth. Um, otherwise, it's just open by default. So uh, things like that there might be nice to um, you know, spend a little time on, make it a little more usable out of the box, with the end goal that we could just you know, bring up this, this container as a pod right away, no configuration needed. And um, you know it would just work. Um, there's lots more to do here, of course. Uh, we um, working on doing a, a OpenShift uh, registry UI uh, as to you know for managing a Docker registry. Um, also, uh, better support for projects and 
uh, users and uh, things like that. So hopefully there'll be a lot more coming in the next year. And I'm going to hand over to Dominic to talk about Tune D. Okay, thank you, Peter. So one of the things that landed in Copit recently was support for Tune D. I'm not sure if you know it, but Tune D is um, enables you to set performance profiles for a machine. If you have I/O or, or CPU heavy use, then you can set a profile to fine tune the machine if you don't want to worry about all the little details. And um, so this was a ni nice event for us. This is what you like to see. We opened the GitHub page and there was a pull request for a new feature, Tune D. So the Tune D people they did the the main work. They changed the API and they said, let's get this into Cockpit. So what we did is we iterated a bit with them. We found, figured out where to place it. How can the user access it? We did the, the, the whole context of where where does the user want actually want to use it. Did the some some cockpit specific stuff, but then then it got in, and this is a success story for us because this is how how it should be. I mean, you figure out what does the user want. We you, you change the tool to to make the user work let it, let it, to let the user work it to work with it in a, in a, in a bigger context, and you make it available in a UI. You ch you change your your API, and that's that's how it should be. So, um, if if you look at where it's placed right now, prominently on the on the, the system page, even if you haven't heard about Tune D before, you can you can access it. You say, oh, what's this button? Performance profile. Let's click on it. It lets you look at different options. You can read the comments, choose something, say, okay, let's go and try. It. Let's try out the desktop profile, and then activate it. And the UI the UI will tell you, okay, this is active. It's a custom profile. Maybe you want to change back. So go for a balanced profile. And that's it. So the question is for other tools, what do you think should be here? I mean, we, c we can make it happen. This is, this is where you want, you, you don't want the user to think about what tools are there to solve my problem. The user looks at a system and says, how, how can I do what I want? And this is, this is what I want to do. Show me what I can do. That's, that's how we need to look at things. And one of the next things we're looking at currently is troubleshooting, and especially SLinux troubleshooting. Um, if you have, if you look at a system, um, y of course you need to configure it at one point. It needs to run, so that's a big part of what Cockpit does right now. But Cockpit is, is more than that. Um, once you've set up the system, and this may have happened to one or two of you, is sometimes they run, run into trouble. Something breaks. Something doesn't work as it, sh as it should. And then you need to go in and figure out what happened and fix it. So SE Linux is is a as a case study for this. Um, it's a it's a good technology. It's it's developed. It's matured. You can do you can fine grain nearly tune uh, security aspects. You need to, you need to consider it during development. Uh, you can do a lot of things, but it has some acceptance issues because when actually so when something goes wrong. What um, it quickly de de degenerates into looking at logs. So you have these complex log messages and try to figure out what really went wa wrong. So what do you do? Yeah, you turn it off. But <laughs> obviously, that's not the best solution if you want, want a secure environment. So how can you make that better? So we have the, the great tool, SE Troubleshoot D, that does exactly that. It helps you look at what happened and helps you fix it. And of course, it's a command line tool. It's very flexible. And what, what really helps is if you can have a UI for that. So the SE Troubleshoot people, they, added, they changed their API, the Dbus API. They made it accessible. So this is a design sta stage for us right now. And what you want to do is you want to log in and see, this is what happened. So I can, I can see what happened and maybe even fix it. Maybe you need to change your rules. You need to change on something else, and you can do, th do that directly in the UI. So the, the thing here is, of course, this is not something that you can only do in Cockpit, but the underlying tool changed the API, or and, and it's just made it more available. So you, you can do all of this without Cockpit. It's just more, more comfortable to look at it in a UI. And along that troubleshooting line, one of the other things we're looking at is container image scanning. So with, with OpenSCAP, there's some, some designs right now to do this, and we're looking forward to get that in as well. So next, I'll hand back to Steph. Thanks. So um, for further, let's talk a little bit more about the troubleshooting stuff. 
Um, and specifically, let's focus on atomic, an atomic host. Cockpit is integrated with atomic host. And I want to answer the question, why and how? Atomic host is targeted at the cloud. And if you're doing it right, if you're doing the cloud right, if you're doing containers right, you're deploying these hosts as immutable infrastructure. You're deploying them in a pre-configured way. You're deploying them as cattle. That's what they, that's, that's the, the going phrase. But, so Cockpit likes to make things discoverable and usable. So it's a, it's a great way to discover how to use Atomic Host, how to configure it if you drive it with Cockpit. But going beyond that, what does it mean to have Cockpit integrated with Atomic Host? When a cattle rancher has thousands of animals and one of them gets sick, he doesn't just take it out and shoot it. What he wants to figure out is why it got sick and will all my other cattle have the same issue? Will they all have the same problem? And this really ties into what Dominic was talking about, troubleshooting, making troubleshooting discoverable, making it usable, making it trivial to then take the knowledge that you learned, oh, this thing failed over here because this, for example, this volume that was mounted into my containers wasn't, uh, didn't respect the proper SE Linux context, taking that knowledge, bringing it back into your um, deployment infrastructure, and then deploying the rest, deploying next time in a better way and fixing that issue. So when you log into, when you, when you, but when we say Cockpit is integrated into Atomic Host, if you actually try to connect to it with your browser, it won't work right away. And it's the, the browser access is not enabled. Cloud instances typically are accessible over SSH, and of course, whatever service they're serving and the containers that they're serving. So how do we make your browser talk to the cloud instance via SSH? This got a whole lot better over the last year and actually now works for the cloud instances. You can connect to one Cockpit instance using your browser. Unfortunately, browsers don't support connecting to something over SSH. It would be awesome if they did. But you connect to one Cockpit instance, and it, you can add others, um, and it will connect to them via SSH. So you can, you can troubleshoot your cloud instances, your atomic host machines, um, and, and log into them without having to enable browser access, open firewalls, or even, as you'll see, enable password login. So here I'm logging into a Fedora server instance. And it's called Falcon, and you can see it's, uh, it's kind of a boring server. That's what it's called. But let me click on the dashboard. There's one server listed here. I'm going to add another one and type its IP address. This first one is a laptop. Ah, look, there's an SSH fingerprint. We're actually connecting to that other instance over SSH. And boom, there it is, listed. And if I click on it, or select it from the menu up there, I can look at the details. Obviously, I can configure it, and in the future, troubleshoot it. And you can see it's even a different operating system. It has different options. And let's add an atomic host instance. Again, that instance is SSH fingerprint. Oh, I can't use the credentials that I logged into the first instance of Cockpit to log into that Atomic Host instance. In fact, passwords are not even supported. But you can see, Cockpit now has an SSH agent UI that lets you load keys, the keys that are accessible on that first instance for connecting to the other. I've just loaded a key, and it turns out that Atomic Host has pretty opinionated ideas of what the username should be, but there we go. We're able to connect via SSH to other instances, okay. and you'll see we're actually logged into these here as Fedora as different users, and to the other one as Steph, and so on. So. You can see that we're building on the real tech that's there, that we've all worked on together, making it discoverable and usable. In this case, SSH. In this case, cloud instances and atomic. But that's, that's the whole story going forward with troubleshooting and other stuff, too. We have built these tools, and they're a bunch of tools, 
now taking them and turning them into stuff that just works for the user. All right, so let's talk about the next topic. Um, and this is a big one. We've, today we, we, we've had to pick and choose the things we've talked about, but we've talked about communicating with a whole bunch of different system services, a whole bunch of different APIs. I mean, between Tundi, Kubernetes, con uh, the, the Docker stuff, uh, SSH stuff. I mean, uh, the list goes on. There's probably about 100 things we talked to. And how does that, how in the <coughs> world can we do that? You, in theory, you would have just complete <coughs> explosion of combinations of issues and, and problems. And the reason that we, that we managed to do this is because of the continuous integration and the testing that we do. So I want to highlight that a bit, because not only has it helped us accomplish what we're trying to pull off here, but it has found tons of regressions and, and with bug fixes and issues in other projects as well. When you open, and I encourage you to open a pull request against Cockpit, you'll see something like this. These are a bunch of different test suites running before merging, before that code gets merged. And you can see a bunch of different operating systems are getting booted, RHEL is getting booted, two different kinds of Atomic are getting booted, Debian is there, different browsers, and so on. Even certain um, Kubernetes images, the one that, that Peter was talking about, is getting booted and tried out. This, when you open a chain pull request hundreds of times, it's booted hundreds of times in different operating systems. Some of these test suites boot 100 different VMs. And what that means is that in a given day, a busy day, we'll easily boot 10,000 VMs testing code before it's merged into master upstream. This is not, this, I mean, this took work, but it's not impossible. It's not the kind of stuff that, that you should shy away from. And that's what this, that's why I want to talk about it here, how we can make this happen more. The, the testing instances are staged in Docker containers. And yeah, the Docker containers actually start VMs inside the containers. I mean, weird stuff. But this kind of stuff is possible. This kind of stuff works, right? Um, we, it's distributed. That's one of the things that we added this year. Before, it was kind of centralized. And we were very careful about the machines that were running this. And if they stopped working, the whole project stopped working. But they did stop working. So we distributed this thing. And we have it now so that all sorts of uh, different verify instances can run the tests that we're talking about. Here you see, for example, one verify machine hiding behind the Red Hat firewall. Here you see two more public machines and a developer running some tests. And all of this contributes towards those 10,000 instances or the bunch of tests across every pull request and every change that you, that you uh, saw earlier. They each ask the GitHub REST API for what, what needs to be done, what's the next task, what's the thing that needs to be tested. And they, they have a way of choosing between themselves. Oh, I'm going to work on this, I'm going to work on this. We try to avoid collisions. But if there's a collision, there's collision detection. One of them wins, one of them loses. And then they post the results, the status, um, and the images like attachments of what failed, journal logs, all of that to publicly accessible URLs. Um, we have a small tool called a sync, and it runs different places people have provided infrastructure, um, provided, like Fedora has given us some space, but other places too. And then those things update the actual pull request and the, and, the, and the API so that we can kind of track what happened. This happens on pull request, this happens on master, and if you, kind of get my drift that the amount of machines here can scale up and down. So if we lose a bunch of these machines, well, things will happen slower, but they'll still happen. And if we throw a couple more machines in the mix, well, they'll start doing testing appropriately. And, and that really makes a big difference. So Fedora has given some OpenStack instances for doing this, for doing, and they do nested. They do. So there's OpenStack instances with VMs that run Docker containers that run VMs. Like, you know, you're really talking nested there. But then um, other, we found other hardware, maybe some of yours, I don't know. <laughs> no, I, like people have given machines and stuff to run some of this stuff. So we can actually make this happen. And what, one of the things that has happened um, 
So one of the things that you need to do to drive this, to make it happen, is push the packaging upstream. So if you're following along thinking, oh, how would I do this? That's one of the first things that actually happened because you want to package the results um, of your, uh, rather the, what you're testing the same way as users would experience it. So the packaging spec files, Debian's rule files, all of those go upstream and you end up testing it very close to what your eventual delivery of those packages end up being. Um, the other thing that's really cool is that QE has worked with us to get their tests upstream. So can you, QE accepts cockpit and then tests it and does delivery on it long after the code changes land upstream. But their tests run before merging. So the tests that they would normally run months later run before merging and you can find those failures. And this has been a big deal, not only of, of the fact that, that they then don't have to deal with these things late, but also the tests get so much better when they run hundreds of times a day. They change from acceptance tests or regression tests into um, real integration tests that need to succeed in order for the project to move forward. So, I mean, this has, this has been a, a big bonus and, and boon for everyone. So let's, oh sorry. So that's another thing, QE testing goes upstream. And the real reality of this is that when you're doing CI properly, it's upstream. You can get some of the benefits by doing CI downstream, but the real uh, benefits happen upstream, including continuous delivery. Every time we sign a Git tag in Cockpit, it automatically creates a release. It automatically pushes out tar balls, Koji scratch build, pushes into Fedora disk git, pushes Fedora Bodhi updates, um, does Coper builds, Debian packaging, pushes containers to the Docker hub, uploads documentation. All of this happens automatically without human intervention. I mean, there is some human intervention when stuff goes bump in the night, which it does, right? Some of these things are not perfectly reliable. But the idea is that when you sign upstream a Git tag that's been continuously integrated with all these operating systems and tests, we can push those contributions and changes out instantly. Oh well, within an hour, without anyone getting involved or um, penalizing their you know, schedule or, or time. And so in the last year, we've done 50 something releases. Each week, sign a tag and it becomes a release. That means someone who contributed something one week and got it in, has users using it the next week. We'll push into the, the branched Fedora, for example. We'll push into Coper Build and all of that. We want to go further with this. We want to see some of this happen with RHEL, too. So we've done it with Fedora, and we're doing it with Debian. We want to see some of this happen with, with uh, RHEL. We've done it with Atomic. So again, the real magic of continuous happens upstream and happens before you merge. You can get benefits elsewhere, you can get some of the cool stuff elsewhere, but if you really want the magic, the oh, it's so awesome stuff, that happens upstream before you merge. And we're running out of time, so we won't talk about the system APIs, which we'd love to talk about, how easy it is to call system APIs, how to spawn processes, call VMS APIs, change stuff from cockpit. The contributions that you heard Dominic and, and Peter talk about earlier where people jumped in and did a pull request, those were easy. Those were straightforward. And I encourage every, everyone to try it, everyone to get involved. Here we're accessing a Divas API just from the JavaScript output on the command line. We're calling various functions. We're accessing properties. Um, yeah, here we're changing the host name. And so it, essentially, the JavaScript running in the browser is part of your system login. There's, there's, thing, there's examples here where you can call spawn a process trivially with a single line of code from the browser on the server and handle the output. There you go. There's examples where you can read files and all sorts of things, and I wish we could talk about this more. And there's even cool stuff like this where now, and this is an example code, but we can even load the GTK app over the browser because of the Broadway stuff that Alex worked on. We have a real session, a real login that starts, 
and you know you have um, WebSocket support and GTK, so it's easy to bring that output into the browser and actually interact with it and stuff like that. So I guess the point is there's so many possibilities. We've taken away all the excuses, and we people have contributed all sorts of different things so far. What's going to happen next year? We have some ideas. The troubleshooting stuff. Um, the uh, container stuff is going to continue, making that better and all of that. But a lot of the ideas and a lot of the driving happens when working with other projects. Helping make those projects better, helping make discoverability better, helping make it cost better. <coughs> so I hope, you, I hope that gave you some food for thought, some compelling ideas, and some interesting stuff. And we're open for questions. Yeah. Um, so the question is, where can we go to see details of the release system? Um, it's all at this GitHub URL. Um, um, it's versioned together with the rest of Cockpit because the tests change in sync with it. Um, and, we, and that's an example of I'd like to work to figure out what people are interested in and document those parts better, make those parts uh, work better. So contact us on IRC or this URL and we'll do that. Yep. How many yep. engineers work on this project? So how many engineers work on this project? Um, so there's a Red Hat team. I think there's uh, five. Five. W one of us is a designer, which is good because we do design-driven development. All of these things happen in the design first, and then there's four engineers. Lars is starting to help work, so that's going to expand it. But this goes beyond just what the cockpit team does or has done, right? These concepts are things that other people contribute to. And that's the kind of stuff that really excites us. When other people come and help, not just on cockpit things, but help with the goals of discoverability and usability, make the APIs better, start building APIs, working on um, the kind of stuff we've talked on. Yes? Does the SSH uh, have another post feature uh, from GSS API and this train server as well? So the question is, does the SSH to another host work with GSS API and those kinds of things? Cockpit has support for GSS API, and the SSH stuff has support for GSS API. What doesn't work yet, and people are working on, is the fact that you can't administer your system out of the, in the default configuration using a GSS API login. Um, there's, there's problems with, for example, escalating privileges, with policy kit, with uh, system D, with, with uh, um, pseudo. I mean, there's ways to get around all these things by manually configuring it, but we really want to see that work by default. So a lot of the stuff is there. There's support for GSS API, but getting the story finished is not done. Yep. So I, uh, this was a great talk. Nobody left. I thought this was a great talk. Um, I, I had a question because I know you guys worked hard on making these views modular. So if I was building some sort of project and let's say I need, I, I wanted the ability in my project to be an admin interface to include maybe the Tune D uh, interface and stuff, is there a way that I can like integrate cockpit views into my application now? And how does that work? Yeah, so the question is about integrating cockpit views into other applications. And so, so much of the stuff that you've seen here and the various sections that you've seen here are independent components already. We eat our own dog food in this area. And then those components are integratable into other projects. And we have examples for doing that. You can do it trivially via iframe embedding. You can get complicated. Certain of these things are Angular components that you can actually share the code via Bower and other stuff and actually implement some uh, of the connectivity for connecting to the API and, and make that part work. So like the Kubernetes stuff or the image registry stuff goes all the way through what I'm talking about here. You can actually take those pieces, and we have, put those pieces in other projects as code. But at the very highest level, every single part of Cockpit that you see here can be embedded in another application. So if you, want, if you have a configuration management system that has a web UI and you want to put an interactive tool for the network or for terminal or for whatever, it's trivial to load that piece and render it inside of the other app. Are, are any projects doing that already? Um, so the question is, are any other projects doing it? Projects are doing this, the second part, the part that where we integrate code, I would say. And there's been examples of other projects integrating views, um, such as the IPA, that was last year, actually, 
um, the IPA UI bringing in a terminal. Um, but I don't know that anyone is actually yet embedding the like full views in. The, the, the point is that we do it ourselves, so we know it works. And I encourage anyone who wants to, to do that to do it. We have an API to even discover whether that is available on a target server or not. Yes. There's a report bug button in the SC Linux wireframe. Um, and, I, and the question is, how does it work? It's, it's similar to the one in the GUI, in the, in the GTK-based GUI, where you think something is broken in the, the, the SC Linux policy. Rather than working around in all your servers, you actually also report a bug. I, I believe that's how it works. Um, you had a question. Oh, we're out of time. Sorry. Thank you. Pardon? Yeah. Oh, did I mention it? No.